Today we're going to talk about vertebrate pests. And these are all the things that are not bugs or diseases that can go after your garden plants. Primarily, we think about all of the cute and fluffy little animals and all of the damage that they can cause to plant material that you are trying to grow. Many times when we have landscapes, we want to have a benefit for wildlife. And so it's not as simple as just wanting to eliminate all wild animals. We want to create habitat and encourage all of the birds, the mammals, the reptiles in our landscape. But how do we do so in a way that does not disrupt the balance of the ecosystem that we're creating? And how do we kind of uh, work with nature rather than against it? That's what we'll be talking about today. So here's our topic, vertebrate pests. We're going to talk about the identification, the monitoring, and the control methodologies today as we go down the line of the various types of uh, larger pests that can enter the landscape. And here our title image is a cottontail rabbit. These are cute and fluffy. People love them. But also, if they enter into a vegetable garden, for example, they can wreak havoc and really hurt your plants. So before we talk about the individual pests, we'll talk about some of the laws and regulations that govern our wildlife. Remember that pest is a term that's defined by people and not by the animal. There's no such thing as a pest animal in and of itself. It's only people that apply that label to any animal that they consider to be a nuisance. Additionally, what is a pest to some is a benefit to others. And even if you don't know any other people by name that benefit from something you consider to be a pest, that animal is part of the food web. So something eats it and it eats something else. It has a job to do in nature. And even if we wanted to think a little bit more philosophically or broadly, you could argue that every living thing has a right to exist. And so it's not only about uh, thinking in terms of practical or tangible uh, goods and services to the landscape, although that is definitely important. But additionally, when we think of the whole concept of integrated pest management, we're trying to uh, get away from a mindset of uh, just targeting and eliminating anything from the system. We want to create a space for all occupants to have some role that does not get out of balance. So from a legal perspective, how do we consider this? Well, primarily wildlife in California is property. It's property of the people. And what that means is it's property of the state, the government, because the government is the people. The government is made up of the people and it manages the property of the people. Uh, and wildlife is considered property in this regard. Another name for that could be natural resources. The idea is it's something that could be consumed by people, maybe is consumed by people, and we don't want to consume all of it. And we need to help make sure that there is a future population. It may sound like this even is a bit mechanistic or uh, kind of impersonal. And it is, but this is the legal framework we have to work with wildlife in order to protect it, in order to make sure it stays in balance. And so because wildlife is property of the people, it is therefore protected by state and federal laws. And therefore, before you embark on any form of vertebrate pest management, you need to determine the legal status of the animal. Uh, it will influence the proper management techniques. A good example is uh, whether or not you need a hunting license to take an animal from the wild. 
many of these species being wild animals um, can be taken during certain times of the year. And when I say take, I mean pretty much kill. The legal term for hunting is taking. And um, yeah, you, you have to do that within the parameters of what's appropriate for that population. There are other animals that are not uh, legally protected and therefore you can do what you want to them, including killing them. And ultimately we're looking for good alternatives. That should be a last resort, just as we have the IPM uh, pyramid for all other types of pests, the same type of pyramid can apply to vertebrate pests where you're trying to do prevention first, exclusion, are there cultural control methods with your plants that you can use to help get rid of the pest pressure? And only then, if you still need to, will you control. And even when you do control, you're looking for those least toxic methods, physical, biological, mechanical, and then finally chemical as the very last resort. A number of animals that people consider to be pests are not plant pests. So it's important to know that uh, just because some people may not like these categories of animals, they might be kind of a nuisance to you in the urban uh, landscape, especially, or they may be disease causing agents or vectors of disease. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are horticultural pests. So sometimes those same animals can be horticultural benefits because they are predators or they are pollinators. And in general, the more biodiverse a habitat, the more balanced it will be. And so a few things that are not plant pests, we have bats, important uh, for pollinating animals, also important as predators of insects. We have cliff swallows. Those are the birds that like to build the mud nests on human structures. Just like bats, the cliff swallows eat a lot of bugs and they also deliver a lot of phosphorus rich manure over the ground. Coyotes could be potentially damaging to like your drip irrigation. Um, however, the coyote is the predator of the rabbit and the squirrel. The rabbit and the squirrel is going to cause much more of a problem. And so you don't want coyotes around your little dog or your little cat, but in the garden, the coyote is more friend than foe. Lizards similarly are going to eat a lot of insects and they are very valuable in the landscape. There are a couple different species of mice that we have in our urban and wild areas. The urban mouse, the house mouse, is usually not a problem in the landscape. Um, and most mice are only minimally a problem. Rats are a different story, but the house mouse is not usually something to be concerned with in the garden. And snakes, in particular rattlesnakes. They are not plant pests. You may not want a rattlesnake in your yard. That's for different reasons. That's for human safety. But ultimately, all snakes, just like lizards, are uh, valuable uh, contributors to ecology. They have a job to do. They consume animals that are oftentimes plant pests. And they uh, contribute in a whole bunch of ways. And so if we can learn to live with them, we will be much better off. Now, with all of these, it doesn't mean you have to just open your door and let them on into your house you can still think creatively in order to encourage them in certain areas and discourage them in others. So if you have a problem with any of these things that I'm calling not plant pests, uh, think a little bit harder, use some creativity, apply your IPM knowledge, learn about the individual and its life cycle, and you can still implement measures to encourage or discourage them in certain areas. What I'm telling you here is for the sake of your plants, you don't need to do anything about any of these animals. They're not problems. And after this, I will introduce a few animals that can be problems in the landscape. 
the, the first ones we'll show you are the more problematic. The, the last ones we'll show you are the least problematic. But of course, that will vary based on your condition, where you are in the state of California, how close you are to the wild lands, and what types of plants you're growing in what setting. Are you urban? Are you a farm? All of those things are going to dictate what types of animals might become a pest in your situation. So the first one we have on the list is the pocket gopher. You can just call it a gopher. All the gophers we have around here are pocket gophers. They're called pocket gophers, not because they're so small you can put them in your pocket, although that's also true, you could fit one in your pocket, but they're called pocket gophers because their cheeks fill up with food as they consume plant material. Uh, these live underground. They only poke their heads out if they are doing maintenance on their burrows. One of the ways to be able to identify the pocket gopher burrow is if it has a, uh, all of the soil that it removes from its tunnel will be on one side of the hole. And so what that ends up looking like is kind of a horseshoe shape or a crescent shape of soil that's been excavated. You won't have a mound of soil in a complete circle usually. You'll have the hole on one side and all the dirt on the other side. And that is usually the easiest way to tell if you have gophers. Gophers can be very problematic to ornamental plants, vines, shrubs, and trees. In particular, they can go down and consume the roots of the plants. And the problem with that is oftentimes you don't realize you have damage until it's so bad underground, the roots have been consumed so much that the above ground portion of the plant begins to show signs of damage. Oftentimes at that point, it is too late. So for this reason, the pocket gopher is a really challenging vertebrate pest in the landscape. When you have them, they're very difficult to control. They live underground, they're hard to see, and their damage also is underground and hard to see. They may also damage uh, water lines, plastic water lines and lawn sprinklers. Their tunnels might divert irrigation water, uh, which could cause erosion. And the mounds can interfere with the landscape, in particular, uh, large parks and golf courses, places that have lawn, often will have issues with gophers creating the mounds. And now you've got to mow over the gopher mound. And it's important to recognize the, the helpful role that gophers play in nature. They aerate the ground with their tunnels and they're generally, they're consuming plant material and they're uh, removing it, they're, they're eliminating that material from their bodies underground. And so they're contributing to organic matter in the soil. They have a valuable role in nature in that regard. But uh, they can be really difficult in the, the landscape. And so here are some ways to control for them. Uh, primarily, we, we encourage exclusion and repellent. And if those don't work, then trapping. A few things not to use are poison bait. Poison bait in general is going to be the least recommended uh, form of vertebrate animal control because what happens with poison bait is that the animals will go um, out of their burrow oftentimes as they die. They are filled with poison and another type of wildlife will come along and consume the recently dead animal and then they become poisoned. So poison is always a last resort and to be avoided if at all possible. So gophers can be excluded with wire that's buried underground. Typically you want hardware cloth and not chicken wire. The hardware cloth is made of steel and lasts a lot longer. If people are building a raised bed, they will oftentimes put a hardware cloth on the bottom to prevent the gophers from tunneling up into the garden box. Sometimes people even plant their trees in a basket of wire. 
Some people have success with that and others encourage not to use the wire because it will damage the trees. And I think it depends on your context. In general, I'm in favor of not putting my trees in a basket of wire if I can avoid it. I would try to control gophers in another way. However, some contexts, you may have so many gophers and you really want your fruit trees and it will be worth it then to put your fruit trees in a basket, although you recognize there are trade-offs. People will also use repellent for gophers. There are many different products. You can have battery operated kind of hypersonic sound emitters that are supposed to scare the gophers away. You can purchase something called uh, fox urine and you can, uh, it's smelly fox urine that you can put around the garden. And apparently the gopher does not like the smell because it's the predator of the gopher. Uh, there are ethical concerns with using fox urine. You know, how did they get it in the first place? Usually they kill the fox. So that's kind of looked down upon as well. However, the same concept applies if you've got cats or dogs and they are in and around the area, oftentimes the smell of that animal, in particular the cat, can help to discourage uh, gophers from taking up residence or from uh, becoming a real problem. So the more uh, predators you have around, the less wild the gophers will go. Uh, the easiest way to control for gophers, it's lethal, is with trapping. There are a number of uh, traps, simple devices that uh, usually pinch the gopher in a certain way and kill the gopher. Normally these are placed underground in the gopher's burrow. Uh, gophers are very tidy animals. If you disrupt or destroy the burrow, they will go and try to fix it. And in particular, like if you plug it up with rocks or if you try to just build walls around their tunnels, they really want to fix their tunnels. And so uh, with these traps, you put them down in the tunnel and they want to go fix the tunnel. And usually uh, you put two, one in each direction. And no matter which way the gopher comes, you can uh, lethally control or kill the animal. Uh, people say, what do you do with it? Some people leave the animal down in the burrow, uh, maybe as a message to the others, I'm not sure. And other people will either compost or you know, otherwise get rid of the carcass, the animal. Uh, in my early days of organic gardening, uh, a gopher was in the garden and uh, the instructor, my mentor, resorted to a lethal trap. And I felt really bad personally about that. And my comment was, that doesn't seem very organic. I didn't have the words yet to really describe what I was thinking. And the instructor turned to me and said, this is as organic as it gets using the trap. And uh, the instructor was implying that the alternatives are chemicals. And I was kind of trying to say, it doesn't seem fair that we kill gophers if we're trying to like, you know, produce abundant life. But uh, there was a lesson to be learned, which is that if you choose to do nothing many times, it means that uh, the plants you're growing will not continue to exist. So you have a choice to make. Do you do some control? Do you do no control? Uh, and every context will kind of uh, lead you down a path of different preferences. In general, I try to err on the side of exclusion and uh, do as little trapping and control as possible. Next, let's talk about mice and rats. Uh, mice and rats, there are several different species of each. Some are more problematic than others. I mentioned the house mouse is rarely a concern in the landscape, but there are other wild mice that are potentially problematic for human health and for your plants. But more than anything, uh, it's the rats. The rats are going to be the ones that could be more problematic. And I put them high on the list, not because their damage is so great, but because they are quite common. And really, I'm talking about rats here, but mice have the same type of uh, situation. Uh, typically, mice and rats will eat 
and contaminate food and animal food. They can consume all kinds of other things, including the electrical wires, uh, wooden structures, insulation. Rarely, uh, mice can spread a deadly virus, hantavirus. Uh, in, in particular, some of the wild species of mice are vectors of that disease. And part of mouse and rat biology is that they tend to avoid new objects or novel foods. And uh, this is important for uh, our landscape design as well as for control of these animals. And so uh, if something new is put out, they don't go near it. They're cautious animals. Mice and rats are non-game animals, and so they may be controlled by any legal means at any time by any kind of landowner. So a successful control strategy for mice and rats is going to include three primary elements, sanitation, uh, exclusion, and if necessary, population control. And the most important thing is sanitation. It is kind of the fundamental thing to do, and it must be continuous and ongoing. And if you don't uh, keep up with good sanitation, then all the other measures will uh, not work. So in general, you want good housekeeping. You want to keep things tidy. And you're looking to reduce the available shelter and food source, in particular for uh, the Norway rat, which is the, the biggest problem in an urban landscape. Any material that you need to store, you want it to be tidy and ideally off the ground. So this includes things like irrigation pipes, lumber, firewood, crates, boxes, gardening tools and equipment, um, any other kind of household goods, you want to keep them tidy and off the ground in order to reduce the area that's suitable to mice and rats. It also makes their detection easier. So you don't want to let garbage, trash, garden debris build up. You want to collect it and kind of dispose of it properly and make sure that wherever you put these things, you've got tight fitting lids. And uh, if you have animals that you feed, you want to watch out for you know how you store the animal food uh, because the mice and rats can become a problem there as well. You may even consider uh, thinning dense vegetation in particular, some plants like uh, English ivy, star jasmine, honeysuckle, if they're growing on fences or on buildings, that's going to be good uh, rat habitat. And you can keep that plant material thinned uh, or remove it completely if you end up with a problem. Uh, additionally, you want to be cautious of tree limbs that are overhanging a roof of a structure within three feet of the roof. You want to reduce those limbs for a number of reasons, including the fact that uh, rats can jump from trees to the roof of the structure. And then if you're looking at exclusion, that's going to be your most successful and long lasting form of control. Uh, so any kind of openings, cracks, building foundations, uh, water pipes, electrical wires, all the uh, general areas where mice and rats may want to hide or live should be sealed up. And anything larger than a quarter of an inch is something that should be sealed. So you can seal with uh, screens that fit tightly. Make sure that the edges of all the openings are uh, tight and don't have a huge gap. Uh, be cautious about uh, plastic, wood, or caulking material because Rats can chew through that. So in general, we recommend kind of a wire mesh or a hardware cloth. And then when it comes to controlling the rat population, typically we recommend trapping. The, the standard trap is a snap trap. It's good because it's cheap, it's effective, and it can be used over and over. So it doesn't cost very much. You do need to check on them, and you do want to try to set them up in a way that uh, makes it so that other animals don't get in there, but these are lethal traps. Uh, some people don't like the idea of the lethal trap, and they'll look for all kinds of other types of uh, traps that are out there, including like sticky paper, or there's something called a have a heart trap. 
The have a heart trap is a live capture trap. And uh, people will take the have a heart trap, uh, get a rat, collect it in there, put a little bit of cat food or something in the trap. The next morning you have a rat. And then you take that and put it in a bucket of water and drown the animal. And that is uh, much more horrific of an experience for the animal. In fact, it's illegal in some places to do that. Uh, then the snap trap. So if you're gonna resort to lethal control, the snap trap is your best bet. The diagram down below shows how you should set it up. The mice and rats, they like to run along the walls. And so you should set it up in a place where they're going to run. Remember, they don't like new things. So you put the trap out and you leave it there untriggered. So you let the mice and rats get used to it for a few nights. You might even put a little bait. Uh, peanut butter works well. And you could even put peanut butter on a rag in order to make it that the, a little tug of war action needs to go on. Allow that to happen for a few nights and then set the trap. And the next night the trap will be uh, triggered and hopefully lethally controlling the rat. Uh, there are all kinds of other methods like the bucket where you can collect the animal in a bucket with a little bit of bait and they, they can get in, but they can't get out. But now you have this problem of what do you do? And uh, it's not as simple as going to your local canyon and just releasing them there. Because what if what you do turns out to be a big problem? And so it's very difficult to uh, do capture and release of any animal. Uh, the number one thing is you don't want to cause a larger problem. And so oftentimes, even the professionals will resort to a lethal control as a, a guarantee that they won't go on to cause a bigger problem than they're already causing. Many people also resort to poison with rats in particular because uh, it solves the problem easily and you don't have to think about it. You don't have to look at it or face it. However, this is where we really discourage that. And uh, it's also illegal in a number of ways. The poison that is used stays in the body of the animal. The animal usually uh, goes outside in order to die and then becomes the food of an owl, a hawk, a coyote, some other kind of wildlife. And then they now are falling uh, ill and dying to the poison or your dog or your cat. And so uh, poison is always not recommended. Glue traps are not recommended. And uh, the snap traps are the best. Otherwise, try and resort to good sanitation and exclusion. Now let's talk about rabbits. Rabbits are going to be a very big problem in a garden. Many people don't have rabbits close by if they're in an urban setting. But if you're anywhere near a park, an open space, or any kind of uh, urban wildland interface, then rabbits getting into the landscape can pose a significant problem. Uh, rabbits are vegetarians, so they eat vegetables, they eat tree and berry crops, they'll eat herbs, they'll eat ornamental plants, they will eat grass, turf. In particular with rabbits, most of the damage is close to the ground. And that's how you can identify that it's done by a rabbit, it's close to the ground. They don't climb trees, for example. But a rabbit can go taller than you think. So if it's like two feet or less, I include that as a good candidate of rabbit damage. There's an even more telltale sign of rabbit damage. And that is that when they bite onto a plant and consume it, they leave behind a 45 degree angle cut. And that's just the nature of their teeth and their mouth, that if rabbits are consuming plants, they leave behind 45 degree angle stems. So if you can see that 45 degree angle in a consistent pattern, you pretty much are sure you've got rabbits. And finally, the damage is usually concentrated in areas that are near to escape or cover. So they won't venture into the middle of landscapes. They'll usually uh, hide on the perimeters and then kind of work their way in. So if you start noticing damage on the outsides, that's when you are pretty sure that uh, you've got rabbits. In the state of California, rabbits are considered a game animal, so they are legally protected. 
However, a recent legal opinion has made it so that if you're the owner of a property uh, in charge of a landscape, you can control for the rabbit without needing a hunting license or needing to follow the proper seasons. However, if you are a professional who is working for a client, you are not allowed to control unless you have the proper license. And so this is one of the instances where California respects private property and they let people do all kinds of things on their own land. Even though this animal is a protected wildlife, um, you can do control if they're causing harm to the landscape, even to an ornamental garden. But you cannot be paid to do that. If you're paid to control for rabbits, then you need to be properly licensed and regulated and with all the proper permits. Just like with rats, uh, rabbits, we focus on exclusion and then trapping and finally repellent. So the exclusion is very effective for rabbits and uh, we include wire mesh. So the wire mesh can be encircled around young plants to keep them safe. It can also be uh, created around the entire perimeter of the landscape. If you're going to build a fence that keeps rabbits out, you need wire that goes down into the ground. And notice the diagram on the bottom left. That fence, the wire is going down into the ground and then even turning at a 90 degree angle outward. The idea is the rabbit could burrow trying to get under the fence and the fence just keeps going down. So the rabbit keeps going down. And at some point the rabbit will hit a floor, the floor of wire, and then they will certainly give up. And they won't you know, usually be smart enough to figure out you need to go backwards and then down in order to get under the fence. So a rabbit fence, you want it to go down into the soil and then turn and uh, up to a foot down is recommended. So now let's talk about birds. And uh, most birds are good in the landscape. You wanna have a lot of diversity of all kinds of beautiful songbirds and birds of prey, no problem. People put out bird baths and bird feeders. That's a good thing too. So here are the cases where birds usually can become a pest. We'll talk about uh, a few of the species and then we'll talk about uh, how they are considered. We have the crowned sparrow. There are two species of crown sparrow that occur in California. Uh, both have the typical sparrow coloring of brown shades on the back and a grayish breast. They're around seven inches long. The adult white crown sparrow, which is what the picture is showing, has three white and four black stripes on the head. And the golden crown sparrow will have a uh, golden crown with a black border. These species will occur in a, in a flock, so there's usually more than one, and they feed on uh, dormant flower buds and ripening fruit, including strawberries and all kinds of other uh, crops. And you can see their name is in red because they are classified as migratory. So they're a non-game bird, but because they're migratory, they're protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and they can only be removed with a, uh, a permit from the federal government. Next, we have the house finch. The house finch is about five to six inches long. The males will have a rosy red or an orange head, um, and otherwise they're brownish back and brown wings. The females lack the red or the orange coloration, and they're all brown. Uh, the color, whether they turn red or orange or even yellow, is based on their local diet. So you can kind of observe and see what color they are and get an idea of what they're feeding on. Uh, finches will occur in flocks as well. And just like sparrows, they feed on the dormant flower buds and on ripening fruit. The American robin has an orange or red breast and gray or brown upper parts with a white throat and a black to dark brown head and tail, usually about 10 inches long. It's a very common and well-known bird. 
These are migratory non-game birds. And again, they can only be removed with a permit. And being a little bit larger, these birds will typically go after uh, fruit on your fruit trees. And if you try to control with bird netting, sometimes you catch the bird in the net. And robins in particular are uh, easy to get tangled in a net. And so you wanna be careful about uh, even trying to control them. Then we have crows. A lot of people dislike crows because crows are successful at eating human trash and any animal that eats human trash, uh, people don't like them. But uh, the crow is a large uh, black colored bird up to 21 inches long. It has a thick black bill and feet. They can be in groups of a few birds or really large flocks depending on the year, the time of year. Uh, during certain times of the year when they're mating, they form very large flocks. Uh, these birds will feed on ripening fruit and nuts. Crows are classified as mi migratory birds, non-game birds. However, given their abundance and their damaging nature, they may be removed by landowners uh, if they're damaging crops. So they can be controlled even though they are classified as migratory. Then we have the European starling. And this one, the name is in white because it's not protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Uh, the European starling is from Europe, uh, technically considered an invasive species. It was introduced to the United States by a few folks who wanted to have starlings uh, appear in New York's Central Park. And the starlings, their population didn't make it for a, like the first round. And so people tried repeatedly to get the starlings to establish. And then once they did, they uh, really did and kind of took over the entire North American continent and pose significant problems. Uh, mainly they outcompete local birds. Why did somebody want to introduce them? Because uh, starlings are mentioned in Shakespeare and uh, the folks wanted the park, New York Central Park to have kind of a Shakespearean experience. So there you go. They're eight to nine inches long. They have a short tail and a yellow bill in spring, but a dark bill in winter. And their plumage is iridescent, uh, black or purplish with white spots. They are found in large flocks. They're often seen feeding on ripening fruit. And these are non-game birds and they can be removed at any time. Now it's important to kind of uh, understand the context. Most uh, perennial landscapes, horticultural applications, you don't need to do anything for birds. In fact, uh, having birds in your garden is a good thing. If you're on an agricultural setting where you're producing a crop, uh, you can have some birds really come and cause damage. Uh, in, in particular, if you're growing grains, they can be really problematic. So the seeds, bird seed, if you are growing plants for seed, that's when you may have issues. Remember, we're always looking at the action threshold and we're trying to decide at what point does the damage pose a problem. And in most instances, birds will not pose damage above an action threshold in an ornamental kind of landscape setting with a variety of trees and shrubs. It's mainly agricultural where you're gonna have these issues. So what kind of bird damage can you expect? Uh, well, they feed on the ripening fruit and nuts of plants. Usually they'll feed most extensively on the early ripening species. So your early peaches, your cherries, any uh, food plant that uh, usually goes ripe first is gonna be the one that the birds really consume on the most. Usually it will be most severe at sites that are adjacent to wild areas where the birds can find refuge, breeding sites, and other sources of food. So therefore any orchards that are surrounded by other orchards are gonna be, uh, have the, the fewest problems. You wanna be in the middle if you're an orchard owner because then you'll have less uh, damage from birds from the outside. And uh, the amount of damage, the type of damage, and therefore effective control methods will vary among species of birds. And it's very important that you identify which species is causing the damage so you can act appropriately. So most of our methods are prevention methods. 
and there's various types of scaring tactics. So there are uh, balloons that are specially decorated to look like predators with large eyes, and they, they blow around in the wind. There are scarecrows. Everyone's kind of familiar with a scarecrow. Um, scarecrow crows get used to uh, whatever's out there. And so the scarecrow usually should try to move if possible. And the second image there showing a laser light show is kind of a modern day take on a scarecrow. Um, lasers can be put in fields and then put on a laser light show for the crows. And that usually does a pretty good job of scaring them and can be kind of randomized or erratic. Who knows, we might select in the future for uh, crows that enjoy the laser shows. And then we'll have kind of uh, rave crows out there in the fields. There are kites that you can put up in the shape of hawks. You can dangle mirrors from trees and you can apply netting or bird netting over your crops. Now with netting, you wanna be extra cautious because the net could catch the bird. So anything you apply, you wanna be careful, monitor it closely and make sure it's actually doing the prevention or the exclusion and not becoming a problem in and of itself. Now we'll talk about raccoons. Raccoons are an urban pest animal and uh, they are native to the area. So they are something you should tolerate if possible. Um, they will damage sweet corn, fruits and vegetables. They will also roll up any newly laid turf looking for worms and grubs. Raccoons don't typically dig holes. So if you see holes in the landscape, it's not a raccoon that's doing it. And they will also occasionally prey upon koi in backyard ponds. And so some kind of cover for your pond will become important to protect the fish from raccoons. So how do you deal with raccoons? Well, just like our other furry cute mammals, we focus on exclusion. Raccoons are really good at climbing. And so special precautions can be taken to try to uh, properly exclude them. The image on the bottom left shows a cone over a pole. So the raccoon cannot climb. Uh, if they climb up the pole, they cannot get around the cone. And that's one effective way to keep them off of trees and to keep them off of posts so they can't get into the landscape. Uh, you can also scare them away, although they're not going to be afraid of people usually. They may be afraid of loud noises or of dogs. Uh, you can try repellents and trapping. And here, uh, live trapping may be beneficial. Uh, but remember, it's not you who has the power to trap and release. And so uh, be cautious with how you choose to control for raccoons. So in California, raccoons are classified as fur bearers. And so these are an animal whose fur may be harvested. And therefore, uh, that law determines when and how raccoons may be taken. Um, however, raccoons that are causing damage may be taken at any time by legal means. And relocation of the animal is prohibited without written permission from the State Department of Fish and Wildlife. And now we'll talk about ground squirrels. Ground squirrels, if you have them living close to you, can be a significant problem, but not everybody has them close to them. And so they're either gonna be a big problem for you or they're gonna be no worries at all. Ground squirrels will go after woody shrubs, garden plants, sprinkler heads, and irrigation lines. Uh, you can see avocado damage on the right-hand side caused by ground squirrels. Their burrowing can be disruptive in the landscape, and they can transmit bubonic plague to humans by fleas. Ground squirrels are classified as non-game animals, and any owner can control in any legal manner. It's important to not confuse ground squirrels and tree squirrels. Tree squirrels have the long bushy tail. They're often gray in color. Those are classified as game animals and uh, they have a hunting season. Therefore, they cannot be taken without a permit. 
And it's important to note that if you're going to do some control for the ground squirrel, you want to make sure that you're only going after the ground squirrel because there are many other endangered species that occupy wild lands. And the control methods for one could be the same for the others. And so you don't want to uh, hurt you know, any kind of endangered foxes, kangaroo rats, uh, brush rabbits, wood rats, other things that are related to the ground squirrels and all, the, all of our other mammals for that matter. So what are some of your control methods? Ideally, we look at fencing, trapping, could even uh, resort to shooting if you are in a rural area. And in general, we want to encourage natural predators. We do not encourage fumigation or toxic bait. However, those are highly effective at killing ground squirrels. But remember, there's a chance that those will go after the non-target animals. With fencing, it's tricky because the ground squirrel can climb. And usually you need to put some type of smooth flashing, which is what the image on the left-hand side shows. Uh, about one foot of smooth metal material flashing will be difficult for the ground squirrel to climb because they have to kind of jump straight up and they can't do that. So you want to put a fence around your garden and you want to put some uh, smooth metal flashing to prevent the ground squirrels from getting in. Additionally, you can do trapping, as you can see on the right-hand side. And there's a burrow as well as a trail where the ground squirrels commonly run. And this would be a place to put a trap. Although remember, you're not allowed to trap and re-release. So uh, think about that carefully. In rural areas, you are allowed to shoot ground squirrels uh, if they are causing damage. But uh, in urban areas, that would not be allowed. And in general, we want to encourage natural predators, just like we do with our other vertebrate pests, and try and uh, eliminate the niche in general for the ground squirrel to be prolific. Now let's talk about skunks. Skunks are active at dawn, dusk, and at night. They consume a highly varied diet. They'll feed on fruit. They'll dig while searching for grubs and other insects. They'll roll back sections of sod, similar to raccoons. The difference is that the skunks will dig. So if you see a hole, you know you probably have skunks. Skunks can be carriers of rabies and other diseases. And of course, people do not like the smell of the skunk when they uh, eliminate the, the scent as a defense mechanism. So like all our other animals, we are primarily looking at exclusion. Uh, you can resort to trapping and you want to eliminate the skunk odor in order to not attract any other skunks. What we see on the left-hand side is a have a heart trap. So that's a live capture trap. And on the right-hand side, we see uh, a type of door that can be put under a house or even on a fence, which is a one-way door. So it basically only allows for an animal to push on the door and get out, but does not allow for the animal to push on the door to get in. And if you have skunks living under the house, something like this could uh, be beneficial because uh, it, they'll, they will leave the house periodically to look for food and they just won't be able to get back in. So the question is, are you smarter than a skunk? And if you really think creatively, you can find solutions that benefit everybody without needing to resort to lethal means. Um, because rabies is endemic in the skunk population, some city or county health departments will assist you in the control of skunks. Uh, they'll provide the trappers to remove them from residential areas. And uh, private pest control companies can trap and remove skunks for a fee. Um, but remember, if you do remove skunks from a property, as long as you don't deter them from coming back, you're going to always have skunks making their way into your garden, your yard, residence. And so you want to solve the problem at its source, if possible. And next, we'll talk about deer. Deer are also voracious eaters of plants. However, it's rare in Southern California that deer are a garden pest. If you move to almost any other part of the country, however, it's quite common that deer may uh, 
uh, be pests in your landscape, which is why we talk about them here. Um, deer will eat many type of plants. Primarily, you're looking for their droppings or for the hoof prints. And these are classified as game animals, so they must be uh, dealt with in a legal fashion. Deer usually feed in the late evening and the early morning, so you don't normally see the animal. Deer usually browse on leaves and tender stems of shrubs and trees, and they'll leave ragged edges on the remaining plant parts. That's what you're looking for. Uh, their favorite plants are things like roses and apple trees. Uh, they do like a variety of landscaping and gardening plants, and uh, if they are allowed to roam free, they can completely consume or trample many leafy vegetables, legumes, ground covers, flowers, vines, fruit and nut trees. And in mid to late summer, the male deer, the buck, will rub their antlers on trees and limbs, including things like fence posts. They're trying to remove their shedding velvet from their antlers. And that won't be a problem for large trees, but if you have smaller trees, then uh, that can uh, break and damage the plant. People hunt deer for sport, and so a hunting license and deer tags are required. But if damage is occurring to crops and other resources, uh, there's a different type of permit that can be applied for for the removal of deer. And usually we recommend non-lethal methods First, trying to prevent and trying to exclude. And after that, then and only then will you be issued a permit for lethal control. So how do you do that? Well, primarily you're trying to modify the habitat. And the best way to exclude deer is with a fence. Deer can jump quite tall. Uh, and so your fence needs to be eight feet tall. And uh, an eight foot tall fence will keep a deer out. Anything less is just going to uh, only keep the lazy deer out. But a four foot or a six foot fence does an okay job as long as the deer have options of other places to go. But if a deer needs to get into an area because it's the only place where food is, the deer can jump over a six foot fence. So you can put a fence around a perimeter just like we do for rabbits, or you can put a fence around an individual plant if you have a young plant that you're trying to get established. And those types of exclusions work well for all different sorts of things. You can see what deer damage looks like on the left-hand side. We have a hedge and all the lower branches are consumed. That probably won't kill the trees that are well-established, but anything smaller or more tender would definitely become susceptible. So now we can look at the opossum. The opossum is the only native North American marsupial. Marsupials are things like kangaroos, and uh, we've got a couple of different species in Central and South America. But uh, the opossum is the only one found in North America. Although it is not native to California, it was introduced to California a little over 100 years ago. The opossum. Uh, is usually not a huge plant pest. They may be considered a general nuisance, but they're not going to cause too much damage in your garden, as long as you don't have chickens or other things. Uh, but they will feed on the occasional berry, grapes, tree fruits, and nuts. They also will defecate on garden pathways and patios, and they can also go after the fish in a pond as well. So there is some damage to be aware of. The control of the opossum is going to be identical to the rabbit, the raccoon, and so we're again trying to look at exclusion first and only control if and when we need to. So the opossum is a non-game animal because it's not a native species. Therefore, if it's threatening any kind of growing crop, the property owner may control the opossum using any legal means. Um, however, uh, those control methods would be the same as for skunks and raccoons. You're looking at uh, properly detecting them using habitat modification, including exclusion. And opossums do not usually become as numerous as raccoons, 
or as uh, problematic as skunks. So usually you don't worry about them, you'll worry about the others first. And opossums are highly adaptable, they're great survivors. And uh, as long as there's food, water, and shelter, they'll figure out a way to stay there. So your best bet is habitat modification. Finally, we can look at moles. Moles live almost entirely underground in shallow tunnels just below the surface. When we compare the mole to the ground squirrel, uh, they are quite different. Uh, a mole is technically not even a rodent, but uh, the mole is very rarely a problem. It's not really going to eat your plant material. Moles primarily feed on worms and insects. The only time a mole might be an issue is if their burrow itself damages the lawn or the plant material. And in an urban setting, they're rarely an issue. But in more of a wild open space, you may have mole tunnels that can kind of snake around right under the surface and become problematic. Normally, you don't do anything to deal with the moles. But if you really needed to, you are allowed to control for them. But uh, there's many other things that are going to be more of a problem before the mole. So this is why they're the last one on the list of our vertebrate pests. And it's important to know the difference between a mole and a pocket gopher. Pocket gopher at the top, mole at the bottom. So there we go with a little explanation of uh, vertebrate pests in the landscape. I hope I helped you to understand the importance of understanding the legal status of the wildlife species and hopefully thinking a little bit about whether or not lethal methods of control are even worthwhile if we are sharing the land with these animals. And ultimately, we're looking for ways to outsmart the animal or at least make it so that their natural biology is not a problem for our landscape. The number one method is exclusion or any other kind of habitat modification where we don't encourage these animals to take up residence and become a problem. Only if and when they do become a problem and we choose control methods, again, remember the idea of the action threshold. We only take action when the damage is above an intolerable amount. And then we focus on the least toxic methods as we move up the hierarchy of integrated pest management. I hope you found this information useful and informative. Of course, there's much more to learn out there. And this is a good general overview of vertebrate pest management in the landscape.